Alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah, wa alihi wa sahbihi wa man wala. You may recall that uh, in my second lecture, I attempted to trace the always tense, often quite dismal story of the mutual comprehension, or, or lack of it, between the three great Abrahamic religions. Um, I pointed out in particular the considerable overlap that exists in prophetic history and the um, disparities that exist particularly concerning the, the last two of the great Abrahamic prophets, namely Jesus and Muhammad. Um, what I hope to do today is to trace other aspects of this um, long-standing um, historical interaction, not so much the religious side of things, but uh, other dimensions. The question of the transmission of science, technology, medicine, and philosophical ideas from the Islamic world to the world of the West. Uh, and as I go in my usual style, I'll, I'll follow various red herrings, which hopefully will elucidate some of the, um, the, the blank spots that have appeared in the various presentations so far. Um, also, as I promised on Monday, I hope to leave uh, an unusually long space at the end for questions. So any questions you might have on today's lecture or indeed on Mondays, um, I'll be very happy to, to at least try and answer them for you. So the impact of Islam on medieval Europe. This is a complicated story. It's also a hugely important story. One could even call it the most important episode of cultural transmission in the world's intellectual history. I think one could make a large, large claim like that for it. The first and historically also the most effective vehicle of such a, an osmosis was in fact the comparatively undistinguished, in some minds, vehicle of trade. We sometimes forget that Islam in the Middle Ages was a great commercial civilization, not just a great religious civilization whose preoccupations were very much focused on, on God, but also a very successful material culture as well. Um, Islam, of course, found this quite easy to achieve because it had its roots in a trading community. Uh, the Blessed Prophet was himself from Mecca, which was a, a great entrepot city, which sent caravans of traders across the desert rather in the way that, say, a city like Venice, a thousand years later, would be sending great argosies of, of galleons across the oceans. It was an entrepot city, um, very much as, as Venice was later to be. And we know that um, the Blessed Prophet himself had joined at least one caravan to Syria. And his precedent as an honest merchant in subsequent generations of Islam lent enormous prestige to the vocation of the trader, the businessman, the merchant. Medieval Islam was not one of those civilizations which tended to regard the mercantile profession as a rather base and, and worldly uh, vocation. It was regarded always with considerable esteem. The second great dimension of this was, of course, the conquests themselves, which within a, a century of the Prophet's death had created this quite unprecedented unitive state which stretched from Provence in southern France in the extreme west all the way through to the borders of China in the east. And one consequence of this was that the great ancient Iron Curtain of the Old World, namely that which had separated the Mediterranean cultures to the west from the eastern cultures, the Indian and the Persian to the east, um, was suddenly no more. This great cultural divide had existed for at least a thousand years. Alexander the Great had done the most to try and overcome it, but of course, as we know, his empire did not long outlive him. So this great new political fact, which completely overturned all of the old certainties and all of the old intellectual and also, of course, economic patterns, um, was the basis for the foundation of this great mercantile civilization founded in the Middle East, which since time immemorial had been by virtue of its geographic position, the great nexus of trade. So two factors. First of all, the legitimacy of a mercantile piety in the Islamic ethos. 
Secondly, the sheer geographical fact of Islam's centrality in the world. And this domination of the world economy by the cultures of Islam continued well into the 17th century. The obvious reason for its final unravelling was the European discoveries of uh, routes around the Cape of Good Hope and, and Cape Horn, and the creation, first of all, of the Portuguese maritime empires, um, which brought to an end the effective domination of uh, countries like Egypt, which had handled previously the trade between Europe and, and India, uh, and also other civilizational factors. But for this period of at least a thousand years, there was Islam sitting astride the world's great trade routes, those routes that are sometimes known to um, economic historians as the Golden Web. And this Golden Web spread out from the Middle East. Um, one of the trade routes, in many ways the most lucrative, allowed truly gigantic caravan trains, including perhaps 50 or 60,000 people and as many animals, to arrive on a regular basis from the great cities of China via Central Asia, cities like um, Samarkand and, and Bukhara, to the Abbasid capital of Baghdad at that time, um, that is in the early Abbasid period, had a population perhaps of as many as two million. From Baghdad, the same goods would be transshipped on to various other destinations. One imp particularly important road linked Baghdad to um, Constantinople, the Byzantine capital, and thence of course to Eastern Europe. To the south of Baghdad, there was the uh, also important trade route down to the Yemen, Yemen being the great source for, for spices and certain perfumes. There was also to the south of Baghdad, the great trading ports of um, a place called Obullah, which really no longer exists. And somewhat later, this place was eclipsed by the, the growing importance of the city of Basra, today the second city of Iraq, but they're very close to each other. Obullah is a few miles to the west of the present um, city centre of Basra. Um, of course, we have from that time the great um, maritime legends of Sinbad the sailor, which um, reflect the enormous cultural importance of this trade and of these two cities. And through Obullah and Basra, great sea routes linked the Islamic empire to India, particularly the city of Surat in Gujarat, in Western India, and further afield to the Indies, that is to Sumatra and Java, where thriving Muslim communities soon grew up, which presided over the peaceful Islamization of that part of the world. Another important city was um, a place called Qulzum, Again, it has largely vanished into the sands. The traditional Muslim name for the Red Sea was Bahr al-Qulzum. Now they call it Bahr al-Ahmar, the Red Sea. And Qulzum was um, very close to the um, present-day city of Suez, at the top of the Red Sea. Um, the Muslims were particularly conscious of the importance of that isthmus. There were serious plans for the digging of what was later um, to be brought into reality as the Suez Canal. And in uh, following the instructions of the second caliph, Omar, a canal was in fact dug, but not to the north of Qulzum, but rather to the west, connecting um, uh, the city of Fustat, just to the south of present-day Cairo, with um, the city of Qulzum, right across the desert. And the canal still exists, you can see it, and there's some ancient engineering works and, and buildings around it. And this, of course, um, acted as an enormous um, stimulus to world trade and cemented the importance of the Middle East in that pattern. Finally, and probably of least significance, there was trade with Europe itself. And Europe was really something of a backwater on this great golden web. Largely because Europe didn't have very much that the rest of the world wanted. A few raw materials, a little bit of silver from the Balkans, for instance, um, cinnabar, came from places in Spain, cinnabar being the, the, the mineral from which mercury was traditionally extracted, and also uh, raw materials, particularly fabrics, wool from England, for instance, um, which um, found its way into the Middle East where it was in demand. Um, you have to recall that by 800, at the latest, the entire Mediterranean basin, not just its southern fringes, 
was dominated politically and economically by the Muslim presence. Uh, in fact, there's a famous uh, French Belgian historial, historian called Henri Pirenne, one of the great historical thinkers of the 20th century, who made his reputation 50 or 60 years ago now by publishing a book called Mohammed and Charlemagne. <coughs> Perrin's idea was that Europe's self-awareness as an entity didn't exist under the Romans because um, Europe was simply part and parcel of a larger Mediterranean ecumenical space. But once the Arab conquests effectively amputated most of the provinces of the Roman Empire from the rest of Europe, then Europe started to turn in on itself and began to acquire uh, a sense of its own identity. Um, and Pirenne's thesis, as it's known, is, is actually generally accepted now by historians. So this was one of the great formative influences of the Arab eruption on uh, the history of Europe. <coughs> 